Hello and welcome to the Women's Sports Show on BBC Radio London. I'm Ebony Rainford Brent, bringing you an Ashes special show this afternoon between 1 and 2 p.m. In the next hour, I'll have chats with players currently out in Australia, as well as reporters who are over there covering their event. I'll also be joined live by the wonderful Lydia Greenway to talk about grassroots cricket and where it all get, begins. Get in touch on 8133, starting your message with the word London, or tweet at BBC Radio London. BBC Radio London Sport. The Women's Sport Show with Ebony Rainford Brent. Hello guys, hello guys, hope you're all well and getting back into the swing of things. I've enjoyed getting back into the new year. I've kind of moved from being on sofa mode to now the inbox is moving, things are happening um, and, and getting excited for what is to come in the new year. I've also been prepping loads for this week for the Women's Ashes, which gets started soon. I'll be doing some live coverage on TV as well as uh, getting some information this week, talking to people in Australia and getting the news. So I'm very, very excited for this show. So the Women's Ashes begins between England and Australia, which will start on the 20th of January. So that's next week, Thursday, and it's actually starting a week earlier than planned after a late change to the schedule. The series will now begin with the three T20s first, then followed by one test match and then the three one-day internationals. And the change now allows both teams to travel to New Zealand and complete a 10-day quarantine before the Women's World Cup, which starts on the 4th of March. There's been a lot of moving around due to uh, dealing with COVID and the protocols as well. England are aiming for their first Ashes series win since 2013-14 season. And this week, we caught up with Anya Shrubsoul, MBE, who is one of the England's fast bowlers and one of the most experienced players who also played for Southern Braves as well. And I caught up with her this week as she talked about landing in Australia ahead of the games. Flight over was pretty nice. Um on a charter flight, which is a which is a new experience. So um, it's just us, our group, the England A group, and uh, a couple of families and partners and various other members of family. So slightly bizarre experience being on a charter flight, must be said. But um, yeah, we're about five days in now. Um, got a couple of practice games coming up. I think I'm pretty much over jet lag. I think some of the girls are still struggling, suffering from not forcing themselves to stay awake on the first day. But yeah, everyone's everyone's settling in okay. I always think it's really interesting how different people handle just traveling and stuff. You've been doing tours forever. Are you good at going, right, this is Australia time. I am going to start working towards that and be rigid. Or are you just like, do you know what? I can't, I can't deal with this. I'm going to sleep when I sleep and adjust when I can. How, how do you manage it? I'm generally not too bad. Um, I, it was a real stroke. Like we landed at about 8 a.m. So it was like a stay awake all day um, kind of job. Um, I'm pretty lucky to... Um, have Lauren, my sister, here, and and I think if she wasn't here forcing me to stay awake, I definitely would have, um, I definitely would have caved. Um, so we kind of forced each other to stay awake. Um, we weren't allowed to lie down. We had to, <laughs> so, rolls in place. so we forced each other to stay awake, which helped. I think some of the other girls, I think, succumbed to the jet lag. But you just do what you can. Um, it's obviously such a long way. You miss out on so much sleep over the journey that it can take a while. But it's just one of those things. You just get used to it, I think. You get used to it. Well, one thing that I suppose you never quite get used to is a huge challenge against one of the best teams in the world. Um, you, when you when you look at all the different tournaments you played, you played in World Cups, World T20s, Ashes, all sorts. Uh, where does this rank for you? Where does a tournament in Australia against Australia, who are holding champions at the moment, where does that rank in sort of uh, the, the biggest challenge? Where does it rank? Oh, it's humongous, I think. Um, for me personally, 50 over World Cups always um, the pinnacle. They come around every four years and and the way the competition set up, you've got to play every team, you've got to beat every team and and it's just a World Cup. It's an incredible thing to be a part of. But a pretty close second to that is Ashes in Australia and um, I've been fortunate to be on the winning side once of that and know how special that is. Um, hasn't necessarily gone well a couple of other times as well. So you just know how, how much of a challenge it is. They're obviously the best team in the world um but we think we're all right as well and um <laughs> if we play good cricket then we know we're capable of winning yeah definitely how have you guys prepared one thing that's been interesting we're dealing with the covid scenario and everything that like that which might get in the way of preparations you had a good summer against india and using really good big wins really you had the test match in that 
Since then, how has preparations been? Have you got enough cricket in that you would like um, coming into this series? I'll be honest, it's um, it's been really tricky, to, uh, um, especially kind of, I guess, um, the back end of December. We had a, we went out to Oman and had a really good training camp out there and was able and were able just to get some, um, I guess, some match practice in that you're not you, you can't get in um, at Loughborough. But since then, it's it's been pretty pretty tough to be honest. Um, there's been people are having to do a lot of safe living um, kind of over Christmas, over New Year. A lot of sacrifices have been made, kind of not able to see families and stuff as, as much as you would like to in order to obviously get negative PCRs on the plane. With Omicron, it's meant that um, where kind of groups of people were hoping to train together over the kind of Christmas, New Year period, that got scrapped. So, I mean, um, Dunks had her mum feeding the bowling machine for her. I think Glennie <laughs> was bowling at her dad. Heather was bowling at Tim, her boyfriend. Like that's 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 the reality of where we were mm. at, kind of over Christmas and New Year, because that's all we could do within restrictions to try and make things as safe as possible, um, but also try and get some training. So I think um, look, it's not an excuse, but the reality is that's not ideal, really. Mm. Um, and obviously, we've lost a week of because of um, quarantine being brought in in New Zealand. We've obviously lost a week off the start of prep in New Zealand. So I think if, if you were to put together an ideal preparation, it wouldn't be this, but it's just, I think what we've got quite good at as a group is being able to adapt, being able to accept, I guess, the situation we're in and, and work within that. And I think probably if you ask people in the Australia camp, they'd say they've not had ideal prep. Um, COVID is tricky <laughs> and things move day to day, hour to hour. So we've just kind of had to go with that. Yeah, I can imagine. I was looking at their prep actually, and I know that the WBBL finished late November, although they've had the season, but actually then there's been a bit of a gap, some of their WNCL game, you know, so it's not been an easy flow. So going into, you know, it's starting pretty quickly on the 20th, it's been brought forward. Preparations are going to look like what now? You've got a bit of England Day intra games, have you? So is that going to be over the next couple of days? So what's the next sort of week look like ahead of the first fixture? Yeah, so we we flew into um, into Sydney and then are in Canberra at the minute. Um, it's the estate that allowed us not to have to do a, I guess, a hard quarantine. Um, so it allowed us to do some training. We've got a couple of, we've got a, a forty over warm up game tomorrow, um, England v England A, and then a couple of twenties the day after, and then we travel to Adelaide and and what we generally do is two days out from a game is a kind of full on training session. Um, and then the day before the game is just what people need. And then we're into it with three T20s in four games. So you're probably going to have two slightly underprepared teams. But I think in lots of respects, T20 is the best format to to start with because kind of got nothing to lose, really. I was going to ask you that. So look, I love this format. I mean, I kind of would love to see some men's tournaments move to a bit more of a points test it or ODIs. I just love the way it works. But I was wondering, even though it wasn't meant to happen this way, the test was going to be first in, what, since you've played a few of these Ashes tournaments, what is the ideal from a player's perspective? And the reason why I ask that, for those who maybe don't know enough about how the point system work, and it's just for the audience, going from being sort of crash bang wallop in a T20, then having to stay there all day and you've got to bowl a lot more overs, and then into a fifth, it's, it's changing different formats. So from your perspective, what's your preferred ideal way of how the order of formats you play well i like to go down in time because you tend to get a bit more tired towards the back end of the tour <laughs> so 2020 is perfect at the end i do you know what i uh, i think i do think having the test in the middle is good it definitely previously when the test was worth six points if someone wins that at the start of the series it's not a million miles off series done so i didn't mm. think that was I think obviously the shift of four points makes a difference with that and obviously changing the order. It's one of those I don't think this tour again is is a bit unique in that we have three days between change of format. So we play three T20s in four days, have three days and then we're straight into the test match. Whereas initially we had a warm up three day game planned and all of those kind of things. So I think on this occasion, I don't think there's any ideal order. I think obviously not. The idea, I guess, behind having the test in the middle is it gives people a bit more chance to kind of build up their loads and and all of those kind of crickety things that that people talk about. But um, I think for this tour, probably having the T20s t- first isn't, like I said, isn't the worst thing. I think for me, ideally, you'd go test ODIs, T20s, 
as you get a bit more tired, you have fewer overs to bowl. Well, that's because you are getting to that <laughs> stage. I need to ask you, actually, I was asking you a little bit before. Look, we played together, which shows out how old I am because I'm well old. So you're not as old as I am, but you've been around for a while. So someone like you now, long, long tournament, how do you go about touring? Are you like, right, youngsters don't need to see you after, you know, I'm chilling, I'm going to my room. Or you still got all the energy. How are you? What are you like as an individual to tour with? Oh, you as know me. As a senior pro, I'm, as a senior pro. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty introverted. So I think, and I, to be fair, I've been like that since I was a youngster. I think I was 16 going on 36. So I don't think I've massively <laughs> changed in that respect. I, I like my own space. I kind of need my own time. And in some respects, it's a challenge of touring for me because there's just, there's just so many people around all of the time. And um. I love them all. They're all great, but t- I tell you what, it's tiring. Um, I guess as like as you get older and as you've kind of been around the block, I'd like to think that um, I guess I'd maybe play a bit more of a supportive role with like, obviously youngsters coming through, I guess, on the pitch with seamers and stuff like that. Because I'd like to think, well, well, between me and Catherine, there's probably not much that I guess we haven't seen or done or, or whatever. So I try <laughs> not necessarily to impart wisdom or anything but I try to just be there as a I guess as a sounding board if people need to talk about anything or or go for a coffee or whatever then just kind of try and be that person if I can yeah I can imagine you can do that and and you'll offer a lot of advice and wisdom in terms of that as well you your role has evolved a lot and now you've kind of stepped into a lot more leadership roles within the team have you enjoyed you know and that's on and off the field have you enjoyed kind of evolving into that leadership and bringing all that experience how, how have you found that process developing as a person I've loved it to be honest and it's probably something I've paid a lot more attention to I guess maybe since I um I guess became vice captain obviously um Nat has that role now but I think since I I started doing that it's something I've paid a lot more attention to and and I actually really enjoy doing it I really like I guess helping people or feel like I'm able to do that or can do that or whatever it is and um in some distractions the wrong word but I think sometimes it's very easy to get very um I guess very insular and very kind of um uh, self-involved for what of a better word so I think it's quite good to well I find it really helpful for me personally actually to kind of um, talk to other people and be able to help other people and not just, I guess, think about yourself and all of that all the time. I think it actually is something that's very helpful for me. Yeah. I was wondering as well, what drives you to and motivates you? So I remember asking Catherine in the summer in an interview, what Catherine Brunt, uh, what drives her? And she said she just gets excited about the, the little challenges, the little improvements. Are you someone who gets motivated by the day-to-day process or are you tournament to tournament like 2020? You're looking at ashes world cup you know what do you what drives you more would you say is it the big events or is it small day-to-day tweaks and changes what's what drives you more i think probably now where i'm at in like my career it's probably the big events um they're what uh, they're elements of the day-to-day that i enjoy i'll be honest there are elements of the day-to-day that i i very much don't enjoy um but you do them because you've got an Ashes in Australia, you've got another World Cup coming, coming up, and all of those kind of things. And and to me, they're they're what you, they're the pinnacle. They're what you want to be involved in. They're why you do all the things that, if you're being honest, well, you know this when you're playing. <laughs> you, don't, <laughs> you don't particularly want to do it. You do the it. Ice to play the ice baths. So the ice baths, the Christmas Day run, all of those kind of things that you really just don't want to do. You do it for. For me personally, for for playing, it isn't necessarily the necessarily the big events. It's just to be able to play and try and contribute towards the team. Okay, and then finally, or, or leading towards the end of this, this is a huge year, really. Um, I'm thinking Ashes, defending your World Cup title, Commonwealth Games, hundred. There's more to come. Um, what, what would you like to achieve this year? What would you, that you personally, and what would you like to see the England team over this next twelve months? do and what do you think you're capable of I think um I've never been someone who sets pers- who massively sets personal goals I just mm-hmm. want to I want to if I can 
if I get selected, I want to play for England and I want to contribute towards the team in, in whatever way that looks like. And um, I know that if I'm doing that, then hopefully I'm I'm helping us have a good chance of of being successful. I've never never ever been one for for any kind of individual targets, a team game, and and I'd like to think that's how I play it. I think as a team, we're we're capable of a lot. Um, if we play our best cricket consistently, I guess we could win all three, but we're going to have to play well for for a lot of the year. And there's obviously some um, some world class teams out there. I think obviously being part of the Commonwealth Games is a huge will be a huge thing for women's cricket um, as a whole. I think the hundred last year was incredible, and hopefully it it builds again this year because that was um, such an amazing tournament to be a part of. And the main thing I probably like I said to you before, I think World Cups are the pinnacle for me. So obviously that's the one that I guess as a team, I'm really hoping that we can defend our title. Great hearing from Anya Shrubsoul there. Really fascinating speaking to her, actually. She was in her room when, when we were doing the, the call and, you know, she was sort of explaining how this COVID sort of scenario at the moment is really affecting the players' sort of preparations. They're in much more isolated, small bubbles or on their own more. It's, it's really been a challenge. So I think it was good to hear from a, a seasoned pro about how she sees the sort of build up towards this series and how they're going to look to go about it. Now, going from a seasoned pro to someone a little bit more young and on the other side of their career, you may recognise the name Alice Capsey because of a remarkable year she has just had. She burst onto the scene with the Oval Invincibles. She came through the Surrey um, Cricket Club ranks from a, a youngster, um, went on to win the 100, then the Women's Regional Trophy with the South East Stars, and also has gone on to win numerous awards this summer as a breakout star. It's hard to believe she's still only 17. Well, she's part of the England A squad that's out in Australia, and she also made time for me this week to chat about her journey and team selection. We all got an email kind of regarding selection, um, which it went to my mum, obviously, because I'm under 18. So, um, still, yeah, still. <laughs> still under 18. Uh, only, only like seven more mums, Jesus. Um, but no, yeah, so when I got home, checked mum's phone straight away um, to find out selection. And then, yeah, I mean, first tour in Australia. Um, it's pretty exciting, to be honest. And we're only like a week in, but it's been an incredible experience so far. Yeah, I was going to say, first of all, have you been to Australia before? Is this your first time flying that far across the world? No, this is my first time to Oz. So um, the flight was quite long, um, especially for someone who's quite fidgety and can't really sit down <laughs> for too long. So no, that um, that was a long flight, but um, no, it was worth it. Okay, I'm going to ask you a cheeky question. Um, did you expect to get on the tour? So when you knew there was an England A that was going to be happening, were you like, right, you know, I think I, I should be on it, or was it more complete surprise? Where were you on that scale? Um, I obviously, when I found out, I knew that I wanted to be on it. I wouldn't say I was expecting to be on it, and I wouldn't say that um, I kind of almost in the back of my mind kind of expected to be on it, but I knew that it was there, and I knew that it was something that the last couple of months I've definitely, like, work towards and that's kind of been quite a big focus of my training since coming back in November so it's definitely been in like the forefront of my mind to get on it um so when I did get the selection it was obviously kind of a great moment because it kind of showed that the last two months of what I'd been doing had paid off um so no I wouldn't say I was expecting it (laughs) <laughs> yeah, but you're doing awesome. Um, the listeners might not, you know, know more so much about what your schedule will be. They know at the moment the Ashes system with the six points. What's going to be you guys' schedule? And is it, are you seeing it as f- performance or are you seeing it as a mixture of an opportunity to develop your game as well against the kind of up and coming next best? So, so talk us through a bit of what you guys are going to be doing and what it's going to look like and what you're going to focus on. Yeah, so we've had a couple of days out of isolation of training um, and we've got a couple of warm-up games over the next coming days uh, between us and the England women um, just to prep us for our England Day games but also for their Ashes games. So that's going to be an exciting few days just to kind of see where we're all at and um, see what, what needs to be done before our first game against Australia A and obviously for the women the Ashes. Um, we've got... I think it's three T20s and three fifty over games, if I um, remember correctly, starting the 
20th, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'll be really exciting. And yeah, when you come on tour with England, it is performance, isn't it? You want to come out here and win. Um, but for me also, I think it is massively, like you said, about learning, learning the new conditions and like also learning off the England women and also the Australia A and Australia women. So for me, it's definitely, yeah, it's about performance and doing the best I can and trying to keep my name in the hat. But also it's about, for me, a massive learning curve and learning how to play in these conditions so that hopefully when it comes to hopefully another tour, I'll be, um, I'll have more experience of what, what I'm doing. So no, it's it's a bit of both. Yeah, I can imagine a bit of everything, but it sounds really exciting. I mean, I can't imagine being in your position like that young um, and out there and learning so much. What, one thing, you, you know, you touched on there, you, isolation and you guys are having to go through so much now. You, you may have had some of that actually in the summer, didn't you, with the, the stars and the Southeast stars. How are you guys managing it? How do you find having to, you know, it's, there's a lot of considerations. Tell us a bit about what the conditions have been like. Have you had to travel over with those masks and, you know, keep a bit of distance? How is it all planning out at the moment? Yeah, so obviously COVID is starting to build up a bit in Australia. So um, there's definitely a few protocols that we're following at the moment with obviously hand sanitising, masks, social distancing. Um, But it hasn't been too bad, to be honest. Obviously, I haven't been in these kind of uh, bubbles, obviously, away from home, but I had an experience with it with the hundred of um just being in a hotel for six weeks so when we got out here we had our PCR when we got to the hotel and it was kind of a quarantine until we got our result back and then we were allowed out essentially just obviously being sensible really um so it hasn't been too bad it was only like maybe a day just over a day in quarantine but um no, we're we're lateral flowing and we're doing PCRs practically every three days. So um, it's still very much a concern and it's still something that we've got to be very sensible with. And I think the medical team especially have definitely put in a big shift. Um, and while they're out here, they're still sorting everything out for us to make it as, I, I guess, as best possible experience for us as players and also for them. So it's just really about keeping each other safe and still being able to do things um but no it's definitely it's definitely still there and still around (laughs) yeah yeah it's going to be around for a while right we're we're all adjusting we're all adjusting um a a couple more things on tour life before i then want to get on to you because you've had an incredible uh journey i want to get listeners understanding more about your journey but in terms of the performance side like what sort of trainer are you so I, i don't know i used to love being you know batter opening batter as well love being in the nets and stuff like that what sort of um how do you go about your training and how do you want to evolve as a cricketer? Because clearly you like to get on with it. That's one thing we all saw this summer when you came out just smashing the ball to all parts. But how do you train? What sort of uh, athlete are you? How do you go about your business? Um, are you relaxed or are you someone who's very organised and structured? Tell us about you. Um, I'd say I'm quite relaxed. I'm not too bothered about like when I do things and the different like order I do them in, which some players have quite a structure. Um, but like you said, as a bass, you, you like to spend as much time in the nest, don't you? <laughs> you just hitting balls. Um, so yeah, I guess when it comes to my batting and I guess with all of my cricket, really, when I'm training, I'm quite focused and you're, you're, you won't get too much out of me because I'm kind of in the zone. But um, once I'm out of it, it's kind of quite relaxed and, yeah, I'm not really too um, too bothered about things, and we'll go with the flow. But I'm quite switched on when I when I start training. So when I'm batting, you can, you won't get too much. Out <laughs> You're not getting in. You're not batting. getting in. <laughs> yeah, oh. no, it's, it's literally the ball and me. Of <laughs> course, cool, cool. and also what about um, you know you got diff- three different areas. You're very good at all three skills: batting, bowling, fielding. How do you balance that in your training? Do you try and say, look, I want to be a batter first and then, or do you try and keep it all organised across the three disciplines? No, I like to do all three. Mm. Like I'll do as much as I can of all of it. So each training session will obviously do group fielding. So you can get all your fielding done in that. And then I'll be scheduled into bowl and bat. So I like to just keep everything going really and keep developing on my skills because obviously there is so much that I don't have yet 
there and there's so much that I can still develop that I think it's important to almost not prioritise one over the other, especially if I want to become an all-rounder. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, a bit of everything. Um, I, I want people to know more about you. I was digging into your history as, well, first thing, obviously, that everyone must talk about is your age. Obviously, you were 16 last summer when a lot of people came to know about you. We'd known about you for a lot longer, but I think you've turned 17 now. So are you still colleging? And also, if you are colleging, are you doing any homework while you're out there? Or is it cricket first, forget about it? No, I'm still doing schoolwork out here. I'm still getting all my coursework done. Um, yeah, I've got one more year. Got my final exams in May slash June. So I've just got a couple of months. I've just got to get through, get my head down and get it done. But like you said, it's it's cricket on tour, isn't it? So um, I've definitely tried to find a balance where I make the most of my experience, but also kind of keep it ticking along so that I'm not, when I get back, too far behind and it's it's manageable really so um at the moment we can touch what I'm doing all right so yeah <laughs> just about I remember we, I used to tour with Isha Gua who's another player and I remember we were roommates at one point and we had work to do and it was just it just didn't quite get done and then you get home and you panic and do it all when you when you get back so yeah good luck managing all of that um and what about you know I was gonna ask about your family because I know you come from a very big family I think you're the last of five you grew up on a dairy farm um how have they like taken to you kind of going into this new world um over the last couple of couple of months really actually just how it's accelerated how, how are they what do they think about you going out and then they must be so excited yeah I think I guess since the 100 really they it's kind of been I guess a bit of a main focus because obviously the 100 then stars and then coming on this tour so it's definitely been really exciting and I think you can tell by how everyone speaks about it. They're all so proud, which is great to see, like, for me personally. Um, but, no, they've, they've been amazing. Obviously, had to escape escape COVID for about three weeks before flying out to Oz. And, like, the kind of things that they put behind just to like, make sure that I stayed um, COVID safe was incredible. And it's not just the sacrifices of the players. Like, it is the whole family. So um no it was it was great and I guess you kind of you put the hard work in so that it all pays off and if it does pay off for me then it, it's almost paying off for them as well so no it's it's great and like you said it's a busy family so um they're they're all there and no it's great I was the last of four kids and I think you're the last of five right N number five I don't know if you know there's a stat which shows that the younger children end up often going more into performance sport because you become more competitive do you think there's there's some of that being the youngest I don't know if you had brothers or sisters but were you all running around playing sport together growing up and did that help do you think to partly make you who you are today yeah I think definitely I think especially with my older brother I think that that was kind of where it kind of came from. Obviously, I was following him around with mum going to all of his rugby, football, cricket, um, cricket games. So I guess once you get old enough to start playing, it's a bit of a competition, isn't it? And even with my other siblings who necessarily aren't as sporty, it's still a competition with at school or with other grades or things like that. So no, definitely, um, there's definitely a lot of competition. Yeah, well, it's definitely turned you into an amazing cricketer already with so much to go. Final question, as you look forward to 2022, you know, you've, you're starting out on an England A tour. There's a lot of cricket to come and who knows how that could pan out. And also things like exciting tournaments like Commonwealth Games, more 100 to come. What are you most excited for in 2022 and what would you like to personally achieve over the next 12 months? I think what's most exciting for me is the amount of learning opportunities that I have this year. Um, we've obviously, like you said, this tour, you've got the 100, you've got the stars and the regional stuff. Um, for me personally, that's obviously, like you said, a lot of cricket and it's just going to, the more I play, the better I'm going to get and the more experience I'm going to get. So that's probably the most exciting thing for me is the amount that I'm going to be able to, I guess, grow my game. Um, so that's probably the most exciting thing and that's kind of what, I guess is almost motivating me through the training at the moment. It's that kind of wants to get better. I've had that first experience of the hundred and it's like, I want to keep on doing it. I want to, I want to, I want to repeat that feeling. So that's definitely the most exciting thing, but 
yeah, I mean, my hopes for the season are quite high after after last <laughs> year. But, um, I can't really get, I think, too focused on that. Obviously, it was a great year and you want it to happen again and you want it to continue happening, but you're not going to have those years all the time. So I think what I'm kind of hoping for is just to build on it and um, to develop my game and I guess put performances in for the stars. I've obviously been awarded this pro contract and it's a real opportunity for me to, I guess, give back to the coaches for the for the faith they've put in me. So to get some performances for for them would be great. Um, and hopefully repeat winning the 100. Well, great hearing from one of the youngsters there who's playing for England A. It's actually the first time uh, the England women have taken an A side out to Australia, which is quite exciting. And Alice Capsi, who we just heard from, top scored for the A team with 44 of 34 balls. Um, and Lauren Bell, who's another up and comer, took three for 35. And they, she took the wickets of Tammy Beaumont, Nat Siver and Amy Jones. So just to, good to see that the uh, next generation for England coming through are really exciting. Now, we've heard from some of the England players out there in Australia and they're ready to start in the Ashes. But what about those who are covering it? Well, two colleagues I've enjoyed spending time going around the world, watching a lot of men's and women's cricket and covering are Alex Hartley and Henry Moran, who are down under and ready to cover everything for BBC, TMS and that team. I chatted to them this week and started by asking them how their trip has been. Well, Ebs, I've got to be honest, I had a bit of a low moment quite early on in the trip. Up, up until last week, I'd only seen three days of cricket throughout the entire Ashes series until the fourth test started because I managed to... I was one of 20 cases in the entirety of South Australia. <laughs> well, you did well we, getting on the record books then. Honestly, Ebbs, I, I'm, you know how much I like to feel special and important, but that was not what I needed. And okay. so I had 10 days in isolation over Christmas. I was telling Alex that I had a decision on Christmas morning when I found a mosquito whether to kill it or spend Christmas alone. It's, it's been that it's been quite a traumatic few days, but we got out of that and, you know, we're in hope about and but everything. I don't know about you, Alex. Everything feels quite quiet and chilled out. Okay. Yeah, but I well, like that. Yeah. How have you been, Alex? Yeah. All right. Sydney was not what I expected. It was completely dead. Um, nobody was going out for dinner. No one was going for a drink. So I was like, well, this is not the Ashes tour I was expecting. Um, <laughs> but Hobart's been a bit more chilled. We've been out for a few beers, but I'm still in bed by 10 o'clock. So I'm boring. Okay, so you guys are mellowing, you're kind of recovering, and I suppose you're getting ready for the women's series, right? So first of all, mm. before we get into the details as well, you're both going to be covering it. It's going to be, what, a joint ABC, BBC kind of coverage? So we will get everything live back, will we, in the UK? You will get every single ball of every single game uh, on the BBC, and you'll be able to follow all the details on the website and the highlights, all that sort of stuff. So there's going to be loads of it, and me and Alex are joining the ABC team. We are representing... England in a face of Australian, well, we think probably dominance and success, don't we? Probably. <laughs> okay, so he's already no, no, calling no. what he thinks. Yeah, Henry thinks that. I don't quite think that. Okay, well, okay, right, let's talk about this. Alex, what do you think? I, I, I'm just, for the listeners who maybe haven't followed everything, if you go back the last 12 months, England won against New Zealand very comfortably. They won against India very comfortably. They also got a test match uh, in there, which was good practice because there's not a huge amount of test match cricket. Alex, how do you see it for England going into the series? I, I mean, they're not favourites, if we're, if we're being honest. They're not favourites going into the series. And now they're going to be undercooked because the Ashes have been moved forward, so they don't have as much prep time. But I think it'll do them well having the T20s first because anything can happen. Um, I'm just worried that a couple of players will go, oh, it's Australia, and they're going to have a minor panic, you know, because they always do. You know, they, they always just go, ah, it's Australia. So I'm hoping that they've got through that phase. They've had a tough training camp out in Oman. Um, and I, I honestly think they'll put up a good fight. Well, I think okay. that I, I'm being slightly facetious. I think it's because I've been in Australia for a while watching England lose at everything that they do. So maybe Can we just, just stipulate for the listener on the women's sports the men have struggled. Mm. So they've. Where are they? Where are the men at the moment in their four test series? They're three nil down. So, yeah. So they are three nil down in the final test match at Hobart. So they're looking to try and get one back in the series. Um, and so, but I think that Alex is absolutely right with the women's series that the T Twenties is more of a lottery. And also, England have done something sensible, which is employ an Australian coach because if you can't beat them without one, just bring one in and see if you can get some Aussie influence. So Lisa Kitely is the coach 
And the hope is that that she'll be able to to you know maybe remove a little bit of that Australia fear because I think it does exist. I think for some reason when you see a team playing in yellow, the same ball might be bowled down at you, but it just has a little bit more pizzazz on it because it comes from Australia. Well, it does. I mean, you go back to the last time the Ashes was on back in 2019. It was 12 points to four to Australia. So they won by a big margin. There was that game down at Canterbury, England bowled out for 75 and Mark Robinson kind of after that was removed. So there is a little bit of, um, like you say, maybe the, and and I was going to ask you, Alex, as a player, when you've been in that situation where you go up against this big side that has this historic record, does that get in your mind as a player? Like, how do you deal with that? Can you park that or is it quite difficult? sometimes you can let it get into your head so that 2019 Ashes was an absolute shambles for England wasn't it you know like we we just didn't play well at all and the series kind of got worse and worse as it went on um but I think the girls have had to regroup from that and they've had to learn quite quickly they then went on to the 2020 World Cup where they where they did pretty well and they could have got through to the final so it's one of those where I often think you learn the most from making your biggest mistakes and England had a horrendous Ashes so I reckon they've learned from those lessons and hopefully going forward, they just picture that they're playing the maroon team and not the yellow team. <laughs> okay, so they just got to get their heads around it. Um, in terms of format, Henry, a lot of people may be aware of the Ashes, slightly different to the men's, which is all about the test matches. The women's changed back in 2013 where it became this sort of multi-format system. Can you just explain like how it's structured in terms of types of format and, and how it's kind of shaping up? Yeah, of course. So we've got the three main formats that, that are played, which are one day internationals, T20s and test matches. And so the way they do it, I actually really like it because it means that every single game has a certain amount riding on it. And also that the different elements of the game are all represented in who wins the ashes. So you've got three T20s, each worth two points, a test match, which is worth four points, and then three ODIs at the end of the series, again, each worth two points to whoever wins them. So it keeps the series alive for a long time. So you can have a bad time of it in the T20s. And then if your stronger suit is the test matches, then you come roaring back with that. So it works quite well. I mean, you've, I think there's an argument that in, in many men's bilateral series and, and women's bilateral series played around the world, you'd want to see that as well, because I think it works nicely. It gives us an opportunity to players across the squad to dominate and do their thing. And so the hope is that we have a really close and interesting series because it's actually now 10 years since England last uh, last had the Ashes or won the Ashes here in Hobart, actually, of all places. So it's been quite a while uh, and, and uh, certainly overdue, I think. Yeah, I really love the format. I think it, there's a lot of context and storytelling. I guess from a player's perspective, Alex, one thing that you know, that now it's slightly been shifted. I think it must be hard as a player to jump between formats. So let's say you're someone like Tammy Bowman, who will most probably play everything, assuming she's fit. She's got to go from playing a fast, furious format in the T20 to adjusting to sort of being there all day. What do you think England will prefer or be their preferred for, for format? How hard is it as a player to try and adjust through all these different changes? It is quite tough, and, and I think... You know, the, the preferred format is the short format cricket because that's what the girls play more. That's what they're more comfortable with. Still, we don't play enough test match cricket. So every time we play a warm up game or play a series, we're actually learning on the job. So, you know, halfway through the India test match, the team was learning. You know, Heather Knight has been captain of England for a long time, but hasn't captained that many test matches. So every time she goes and captains, it's been two years since the last test. So she kind of forgets where she left off. So she's got to start again. So it can be quite difficult, but. That means it can be quite difficult for both teams. But I think England will prefer it starting with the T20s now because they haven't got as much prep time, so anything can happen. And then obviously, if things go wrong and things go sour, they can use the ODIs at the end of the series for the World Cup preparation. Okay, so uh, that is sounding good then. I think it's coming into England's favour with the T20s ahead. Maybe Alex is right and England might have a, a slightly better series than Henry's predicting. But let's start breaking down, actually, which players are important for England. Sorry, I'm putting you on it there, Henry. I'm going to ask for predictions at the end, so just start getting your head around it. So I think for England, we know some of the key names. I was looking at the record. Tammy Beaumont had an incredible year last year, over 500 runs in the last 12 months. She finished on 100 against New Zealand. Is she going to be a key? Who is going to be sort of a standout for England, Henry? Uh, I think Tammy Beaumont definitely is, is a key player across all formats. And the captain as well, Heather Knight, is experienced. Now, she's been in the job 
for nearly six years, which is crazy. It's a long time that she's been leading this England side. Uh, also, Matt Siver, who's one of the world's best all-rounders, I think could be a really important player. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how England use their fast bowlers because Anya Shrobsol has been a main part of the bowling attack for, for well over 10 years now. But there are other players that are now becoming a little bit more of the mainstay, maybe Kate Cross, who Alex does that podcast with. You can find on BBC Sounds, I should say. Uh, Tash Farrant as well, who offers the left arm option. And so there's there's different options that they could go for. So I think that'll be really interesting to see. Uh, and and then I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go for the spin bowlers because Alex, you know far more than I do about <laughs> that. Sort of yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, Alex. So Charlie Dean is a is a big name who kind of burst onto the scene. How's England's spin department looking? Um, and and how do you see someone like her as a youngster going? Yeah, honestly, England's spin department is where their strength is. They've got the world's best T20 bowler, Sophie Eccleston. And then you've got the second best bowler in Sarah Glenn, the leg spinner. And now you've got the off spinner, Charlie Dean, who can probably bat at seven or eight as well if, if asked to, to bat higher up the order. So the spin department for England is so strong. I don't really don't think they need to worry about that. It's just when they play the test match, it's Australia. The pitches are a bit harder. Are they going to go a left arm spinner and an off spinner against the Australian left-handers, or are they going to stick with the seamers? Uh, a question I'm going to throw at you, Henry. England are bringing a young England A side over. Young player who was hyped up last summer during the 100, Alice Capsey. Maybe a couple of people intrigued to see, could a young player like that make her debut? Would you say it's a little bit too early for someone like her? Or would you have liked to see her after her explosive summer from the 100 play, maybe even in the T20s? It's a really interesting question, that, because she's so talented. We've seen that. We've seen what she's done for Surrey and, and how successful she was playing uh, for the Oval Invincibles in the 100 competition and how actually nothing seemed to phase her. And that is the joy, I guess, of something like the 100, where these young players come into the side and get exposure to the, the pressures of television and big crowds and all that sort of thing. So we're getting more to the stage where if you're good enough, then you're old enough. And she's not far away from being good enough to get into this side. And having an A team there for England will just remind those players that are in the main squad that there's some pretty good players knocking around as well. So you can't rest on your laurels. You've got to be absolutely on it. And if Alice Capsi doesn't play in this Ashes series, I think we can be pretty pretty confident that she's going to play in a number of series going forward in the future. So it's a matter of time, but maybe I would expect maybe it might just be a little bit early for them this time, but, uh, but we'll wait and see. All right. What about the Aussies? Okay. So I'm looking down this list and there's some names in there. Okay. Ashley Gardner whacks it out the park. One of the, the strongest Australian strikers in the game. Meg Lanning, the captain just churns out runs. They've got a lot of fast bowlers coming through. Talia McGrath, Taylor Valemic. And we can't forget Elise Perry. How do you think Australia are looking? Are they just dominant as ever? Or do you see any weaknesses there? No, I do, I do see a lot of weakness, actually. There's no, they're missing two of their main spinners in, in Sophie Molyneux and Georgia Wareham. So they've had to bring in Alana King, which has been a bit of a surprise. Everyone was thinking Amanda Jade Wellington would get selected. She's been, you know, she was leading wicket taker in the 100 over in England last summer. She's been dominant in the WBBL for a long time now. Um, but she's just missed out to Alana King, who Australia have said is more like Georgia Wareham, whereas Wellington is a genuine spinner and spins the ball sideways, whereas Alana King will beat both sides of the bat. So yeah. there's a weakness there. She's potentially going to make her debut. Darcy Brown, really exciting fast bowler, but young, inexperienced. If you can get on top of somebody like that, you know, you can really take advantage. So I think for the first time in what seems like forever, there are weaknesses in this Australia side. Yeah, one other thing as well for England fans who maybe used to Australia dominate. And I was looking actually that WBBL finished in November. So it wasn't yesterday. There's been a bit of a gap. Um, some of their National Cricket League games have been cancelled due to COVID. So they're not necessarily coming in with the preparation they would like either, are they? No, you you would expect going into an Australian summer that Australia would have had the, the prep that they wanted. Rumour has it there's some disturbances with COVID within the camp as well. So they've not had major prep. Um, and obviously uh, quite a lot of WNCL games have, have been postponed and cancelled and the B WBBL was such a long time ago. So they're actually in a pretty similar position to England going into this Ashes, Ashes a bit underprepared and, and a bit, well, we're going to have to just get on with it. OK, well, I like that. Well, look, final question. I'm going to pin you both to it. There's 16 points available. I don't want you sitting on the fence. Right, Henry, you're, you're, you look ready. Where I'm are you 12. going? 
I'm going 12 4 Australia. They're going to be too strong, but there's going to be encouragement for England in the series. They're going to do better than people expect, perhaps, and they're going to win a couple of matches. Wow. Okay. So you've gone big 12 4 Australia. Alex? I really wish I could say that England were going to win the series, but I'm going to go 10 6 Australia. Interesting, interesting predictions there. I, I like it that Henry is just, I think he's been out there watching the men struggle in Australia and he's just put it out there. He thinks 12-4 to England, but Alex, a little bit more positive, 10-6. I am going to I'm gonna reserve my prediction until later in the show. What I do think, though, is the T20s and getting started there. If England can come out the blocks with two quick wins, I think they could actually sneak quite an interesting series. I'll come back to that in a bit. Now, we've been talking professional cricket and obviously the, the national side, but where does it all start? It's really important um, to look at the grassroots of cricket and, and clubs, of course. So it's really important to get young women and girls into the sport. And someone who aims to do just that is Lydia Greenway. Lydia is a former England cricketer, commentator, and has also set up Cricket for Girls. And maybe these could be some of our future Ashes players coming through. Lydia, first of all, welcome to the show and great to have you. Hi, Ebs. Yeah, great to be here. I've really <laughs> enjoyed the show, show so far and yeah, looking forward to chatting more cricket. Yeah, lots to talk about. Um, I'm going to pin you to it early, actually, before I get into the grassroots stuff. Have you got a prediction? Are you, you, you watching or from far thinking, you know, it's going to go well or, or, or do you think it's going to be a pretty tough tour? Oh, no, I, I think the girls have, um, you know, they've developed a huge amount over the years. So I'd always back England and I, I'd go, I reckon I'm going to go 10-6. I think they can, they can get a few early wins under their belts in the T20s and hopefully that will give them a, a good bit of momentum. All right. Well, I've written that down. I'm going to keep a note and later on in the ashes, I'm going to be texting you all. Um, anyway, look, you've had a, a su successful international career. Um, it'd be interesting to know how you first got into sport, because I, I love talking about grassroots and community. Where did it start for you and how did that develop as a younger player? Yeah, I think my um, sort of journey started really very similar to a lot of girls my age or our age. I think it was always a male relative so my dad plays cricket and and by default really that's how I got in the game so we would go up to our local cricket club um, in Kent and, and watch him play and with my brother and sister that's how we we got into the game and I, and unfortunately I think that meant that you know for other girls who maybe didn't have male relatives they didn't always get that opportunity to play the game but I think the good thing now is it's, it's being played a lot more in the schools and um, with rounders obviously being taken off the curriculum at GCSE level, that's um, left cricket as a natural replacement. So I think, you know, from that participation level point of view, I think we're now seeing more girls pick up a cricket bat and, and it become more of, of the norm, which obviously for, for everyone involved is, is brilliant. From your perspective, do you, do you think there's just a direct link between grassroots and professional? So what I mean by that is the more girls that play, the better England team we have, or is it a bit more to it than that? How do you kind of really up the standards and make the grassroots really work to produce the future players of the, the next generation? Yeah, I, I think it's exactly that. I think people talk about the performance pyramid and obviously the, the further up you go, the, the harder it is to, I guess, progress. But the more that you have in that bottom layer of the pyramid, the more chance you've got of producing some really exciting cricketers. And I look back at my time playing and I see the young girls coming through now, you know, at under 11 county age group level, and they are just really good cricketers and there's more of them as well. So I, I think that naturally leads to standards improving. But I also think the other piece to it is the people delivering the coaching I think you, you have to have good coaches involved you have to have the teachers on board as well um, and I think we, again we've seen a shift in the amount of female teachers in particular the PE teachers um, looking to upskill themselves because the, those people as much as anyone um, play a real sort of vital role in, in instilling that enjoyment and fun of the game and I think everyone remembers their favourite PE <laughs> teachers and, and that's why I think, yeah, they're obviously really important as well. They are. I'm just thinking of Mrs. Pickard, who was my kind of all-round <laughs> sports teacher. She was a she was a taskmaster, I tell you that. You learn about discipline, but you're right. It does make a difference. Well, tell me about, you know, Cricket for Girls. I know we've spoken about some of the work you've done, but 
Tell me about why you set it up and what it's doing and, and hopefully how you can get that pyramid going as well. Yeah, so I initially set Cricket for Girls up when I retired from international cricket. So that was back in uh, 2016. And the idea really behind it was to try and uh, provide young girls with female role models. Because I think, uh, without being too much of a... Um, of a blanket statement, I think you generally get two types of girls who are now playing the game. I think you get the ones mm -hmm. who, they don't mind who they're coached by, you know, male or female. They don't mind who they play with, so they don't mind if they're playing with the boys or with the girls. Um, and then on the other side of that, you get the girls who are playing the game from a real social element. They just want to have fun. They don't necessarily want to progress and, and be the best. And that's where I think um, the female coaches and the female teachers are really important. So with Cricket for Girls, we've, um, we've got a team of coaches who go into the schools and we don't just deliver coaching sessions in the schools, but arguably the most important thing we do is we train the teachers. Um, mm -hmm. I guess going back to the point I mentioned is, you know, if you've got a, a massive uh, sort of group of teachers who are able to deliver the game, then that that's always going to spread further, and um, you're going to create a, a, a larger number of girls playing the game. So yeah, that that's sort of where we operate, and we're we're building mm -hmm. a, an online platform as well because obviously you want to make it accessible, and I think you also need to make sure that it isn't just in the private sector either. You want it to to go into state schools, and you want to make it um, as accessible as possible, and um, yeah, so, so that's the work that we're doing and, and obviously we're really passionate about it and, and are keen to make a difference. I've also noticed as well, you know, you, you start looking at the, the kit and the clothing and what girls actually wear and do they feel comfortable. Do you think that makes a difference just in terms of, you know, if you take up the sport, but you also feel that you can dress in a way that feels comfortable and um, a little bit more modern as well? You know, tell us about some of that and your experiences there. Yeah, so that that's really important. I think when you and I were playing, we were playing in parachutes for, for our playing shirts. <laughs> they were literally it was like pajamas. <laughs> yeah, absolutely massive. But yeah, that that's really important. So um, you know, I, we we sell equipment online, which is you know has been specifically picked for females to use. And although there are only small differences, you know, the the straps of the pads are a bit. Um, shorter so that you don't have the the, the overhanging that you normally get because obviously generally females calves are, are smaller the same with the straps on the wrists as well so I think all of those things as much as we probably didn't see them as barriers because um, well for, speaking from experience I had a dad who was able to pick out the right equipment for me I think we're now seeing girls whose parents don't really know cricket and so but you want to make that as easy as possible rather than them having to sort of sieve through all the um, all the other equipment that is predominantly aimed at, at uh, men and at boys. And, and that's the same for clothing as well. We've, um, you know, sort of worked to develop some, some cricket clothing that is suitable for females. And I think it's important that they, they feel good because I think that gives them confidence as well when they go out onto the cricket pitch. Yeah, definitely. And a final question with Cricket for Girls and all the work that you're seeing in the community, what would be the dream for you? What would you like to see for Cricket for Girls at the end of 2022, say? What would be on your wish list? Oh, I think just, I guess it's always small steps. I think the big goal is just to have, you know, ideally every girl in every school playing cricket. But I think, yeah, I guess you get there through the smaller steps. Thank you. So, um, in, yeah, for this year, I think it's more about... Um, you know, just incrementally getting those teachers trained up, the coaches and, and also just more girls playing the game. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, Lydia, thank you so much for your time. Good luck with Cricket for Girls. And I know you'll be watching the Ashes keenly. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Eb. All right. Well, as we're wrapping up the show, I think everybody will be looking forward to the Ashes, especially with how the men have struggled. So don't forget, it's going to be 16 points across three T20s, three ODIs and a test match. And it's going to kick off on the 20th of January. The first T20 is going to be in Sydney. And I think it comes a little bit into England's favour with it starting off with the T20. So that's really, really exciting. It's been amazing to be able to do a women's ashes sports show, something that's uh, really passionate to me. And I hope you uh, guys are well enjoyed it today.